pathophysiology was a curious way of getting into it. It, it, it was actually by, uh, by accident. We just doing some basic biology, we found that uh, there was something on the surface of infected rat cells, uh, which made them stick to, to cells, which had a, a sort of parasite antigen on the surface of the host cell. And that completely opened up the field because nobody actually knew that. And so we discovered um, antigenic variation, which, which is now a very big uh, area in malaria. And also, because it sticks to, to cells, we, we, it, it opens up the explanation for cerebral malaria and for malaria in pregnancy, which again ha has expanded in, uh, a lot in the last few years. Very, very interesting uh, part of research and on malaria. And um, this was really by accident because we were looking for something completely different. An interesting question because uh, I think that the um, statement by Bill and Melinda Gates uh, a few years ago saying we want to eliminate malaria rather than just control it uh, at the time was shocking to the malaria community because they said, well, What are they talking about? We, we've tried for years, it doesn't work. Uh, but it really stimul stimulated research in completely new areas, and particularly transmission, uh, because if you want to eliminate malaria, you really want to work on the stage that transmit to the mosquito and block that stage, which was a very neglected area. And that's probably where the most exciting discoveries are happening now. In, the, in contrast to that, uh, work on malaria vaccines, which had been a, a very, very uh, um, important areas of concentrated research has been very poor, really. Um, very little things, very little has happened in that field, disappointingly little. So uh, that, that, that is uh, the fact that we're now working on transmission blocking is a very interesting uh, area. At the moment, the uh, production of artemisinin from plants works well. It's not a problem. It's not an issue. The actually being able to make it from yeast is obviously theoretically a good idea. Uh, none of those products have yet been tested properly. So we, are we actually producing the same compound? Do we need, uh, I mean, uh, people who work on, uh, on natural products say that we actually need a synergy with, uh, with other part of the plant to get the best effect. So can we actually get that from yeast produce? It's questions that need to be answered and uh, uh, wait and see. Well, the main barrier is uh, if, uh, if um, the parasite get resistant <coughs> The main barrier is that the parasites get resistant to artemisinins, which they are doing in Southeast Asia, in Cambodia particularly. Uh, if the, those resistant parasites spread, um, the benefit of, uh, of having those pr uh, products is going to be lost. And at the moment, we don't really have a replacement. So um, you have to remember that in the 70s, um, just using chloroquine and uh, DDT, uh, malaria was almost eliminated from Sri Lanka. I mean, it went from um, about a million cases a year to something like a hundred cases a year. And then the country decided to drop uh, the programs for elimination or because it was too costly and hardly a, hardly a problem anymore. Yet a couple of years later, it was back to a million. So it's something that's very fragile. It's something that needs to be done consistently for 25 years before you can eliminate. And if in the meantime, your tools don't work anymore, that's going to be the major, major issue. We don't really know. Uh, we, 
we can't really recognize it properly uh, because many of the uh, of the resistant uh, phenotype are based on a on a very simple uh, uh, mutation. This is obviously not the case here. Uh, resistant to chloroquine was for a long time uh, not understood because the resistant phenotype wasn't an easy one. It was a mixture of various mutations which you needed all or three or four before you could actually have the resistance. And uh, so I guess m it may be something similar uh, uh, with artemisinin. Yeah, it's early days. Um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, put any my money on any, uh, any bets on that one. It's possible to, uh, to uh, do various things to the mosquito and make it uh, incapable of transmitting uh, dengue or malaria. Uh, to actually get that gene in the in the wild is another issue. Uh, it's possible technically, but it's very difficult to to put that n that new mosquito out because not only that you have to give it a uh, uh, genetic uh, advantage, so it actually takes over the natural uh, population. I think it is very important. Uh, uh, um, we, uh, we did some surveys on what people where people used to publish uh, 10 years ago before Malaya Journal and um, where they publish now. And a majority of articles on malaria are now in open access journals. Malaria Journal has 12% of all the malaria papers published in last year. PLOS One, uh, an open access journal, uh, has almost the same amount. Um, and uh, so a, a large n number of papers published in, on malaria are in open access journals. Malaria Journal has, um, because of uh, they don't, uh, African authors don't have to pay also publishing charges. Uh, uh, many of them publish in in, uh, in open access uh, journals. Uh, out of 300 or so papers published in 2011, did a survey, 105 were with African first authors. This is very important, uh, but, but at the same time, for African authors to publish in open access journals is actually has got a very perverse negative effect on the development of African journals, and I think that uh, the development of Af of African or national and regional African journals is very important for. Uh, the, the scientific development of those countries and uh, in a way th to actually have uh, open access international journalists competing locally is, uh, is a bad thing I think. So this is a, a perverse negative effect which we have to counter somewhere. It's a, it's it's a very difficult one. The, the dif uh, uh, an issue we we are addressing with uh, uh, WARN, which is a world uh, wide uh, network for anti malarial resistance, where they they they're trying to get raw data uh, accessible so people can use them, interpret them, but they are facing a big issue because to actually make those accessible. Uh, people aren't always, not always ready to, to do that. They, they, they tend to be very protective of their data. Um, probably wrongly, but uh, because there probably are, would be many feedbacks if they weren't protective. But uh, that, uh, uh, I think it's important, but it's, it's going to be a, an uphill struggle to get people to, to actually make raw data available. There need to be a recognition of whose data they are, and uh, in in a system where people's promotion, people's career depends on publication, 
uh, that is is always going to be a, a handicap. So some somehow there has to be a learning process from people who de deciders who decide on careers and promotion that actually having a, being part of a big uh, international database is uh, is a plus. Uh, that, but that's not the case. We're a long way from that.